EPI, unlike most other uh, publishing companies, produces books in simple language, easy to understand English, and those books are translated into other languages. Because it's simple English, they're very easy to translate as well. So EPI produces literature that is, that is in simple English, that's easy to understand. Most of our books are sent overseas, free of charge, to missionaries and national workers. And that is the most exciting thing about everyday publications. Jesus Christ said, if you love me, feed my sheep. If there was a better way of feeding the sheep, Dr. Harlow wanted to find it. We were in a board meeting one day and Dr. Harlow uh, came in and you could tell he had an agenda. He then went into a discussion about what kind of disposable income the people that we were servicing would have. Well, of course, they didn't have enough money to buy our books in the middle of Africa or other places in the world. So it wasn't long through that discussion that um, Dr. Harlow said something like, the purpose of everyday publication has always been to feed the sheep. You can't feed the sheep when the feed is in the back room and they're in Africa. So it wasn't long before the board made the decision that there would be free books. Free books to missionaries around the world. It was an amazing decision over 20 years ago. And to this date, it's still going on and we're still here. And we've sent out more books. Millions of books have gone out. and nobody can take responsibility for that. The Lord has paid for every one of those books. And it's got to people in all parts of the world. I'm sitting here in the Gospel Hall in Saroy, Botswana. And every Saturday we have a Bible class. And I'm sitting here with the group who normally come. Some are not present. And we are going through one of your books, which is called The Church of the Book. And we have been greatly helped as we uh, discuss all these important points that have come up. It is our prayer that we might delight the people that they speak about in this book, and that we will be helped to be servants of the Lord. May the Lord bless you all. Amen. Ed faced quite a number of hardships in his early life. He was born in Toronto, and when he was quite young, he moved to um, Detroit with his family. And while there, um, he, had a, he had several siblings who were born, but um, his father uh, left him, left the whole family when he was age six. And it was a very difficult experience because he never saw his father ever again during his childhood. By the time he was seven, he was out selling newspapers, trying to supplement the family income. And uh, he would um, sell the, the papers every day and then take the money home to his mother and just keep enough to rebuy the newspapers uh, for another day. And uh, of course, this wasn't enough to support a woman with uh, four little children. So the mother decided to move the family back to Toronto and he lived for many years with his grandparents. And um, during that time, he lost one of his sisters 
She was age two and she died of diphtheria, so that was something he had to handle as a child. Um, he made a very important decision at the age of 12. He confessed Christ as his savior and, and God used Romans 10 and 9. Um, if you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and shall believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And he believed that with all his heart. But the mass of the people walk right on, coming from they know not where, going to they know not where. Empty lives, empty hearts, without God, without Christ, without hope. The Lord Jesus Christ commands his disciples to follow him and promises he will make us to become fishers of men. In spiritual fishing, rewards will be given to those who go forth to win souls and to those who help from the shore by holding on an intercessory prayer. May the Lord, when he comes, find us so doing. As um, a child, we just heard that he did suffer many hardships, short of finances, um, short of food, uh, sickness in the family, death in the family, and that did help prepare him for life on the mission field and life that was to come because he suffered the same things when he went off to Africa in 1935. Dr. Harlow and his wife went to the Congo as missionaries in the 1930s. When they came back to Canada for their first time of furlough, it was, it was the late 1930s, and before they were able to return, the Second World War had begun, and so they weren't able to go back right away. So Ed, along with Ernie Tatham and John Smart, started teaching an evening Bible class for young people. Well, the response was so overwhelming, they couldn't keep up with the demand, so they prayed about a way to effectively teach all the young men and women who were eager to study. Ed was talking with, again, Ernie Tatham and John Smart, and they were up at the Guelph Conference Grounds. You can actually see the place where they got this vision, or where Ed shared this vision. It's right by the tennis courts there at the Guelph Conference Grounds. But he, Ed had the vision for a correspondence type of ministry correspondence course type of ministry. And that was the beginning of the Emmaus Correspondence School, which has sent courses literally to every corner of the world. This is Esther Fry from Puerto Rico, working with Bible Correspondence Courses. Congratulations on your 50 years of service to the Lord, and to God be the glory. I have had the privilege of receiving many of the courses in Spanish and uh, they have been such a blessing. Being donated helps me because most of my students are prisoners and most of our booklets are used for gifts with the diplomas as well. The testimony that I have from one prisoner is on the book of the Psalms. It was such a great blessing to him and he learned how to pray in a different way. He also learned that God is in control of all things, including whatever circumstance he goes through, and it will be the rest of his life. This is only one testimony of many. Thank you to the Lord. Ed got the vision along with Ernie Tatham and John Smart to start a Bible school in Toronto. And this was, this was the beginning of Emmaus Bible College. I met Harold, one of the co-founders of Emmaus Bible School, way back in 1941. This is where it all started, Central Gospel Hall in Toronto.
Later on, he lost his wife to cancer, which was a very difficult experience. Within a year or two, he married Gertrude Koppel in 1964. And um, at that time, he had in his mind to start writing some books. And um, he wanted them to be simple so the Africans would be able to understand them. After Ed Harlow had been a part of the founding of Emmaus Bible College and Emmaus Correspondence Schools, he was led of the Lord to found everyday publications. I would say that at some point 50 years ago, Dr. Harlow and Mrs. Harlow had a discussion and they came to a conclusion about something to do with, it, with what became everyday publications. I have it from Della Lettman's book, um, it's it, No Time to Quit, you know the book, it, it's, uh, it says this, Dr. Harlow speaking to Mrs. Harlow, Gertrude, with God's help I would like to see a commentary in simple English on every book in the Bible. Mrs. Harlow replies, good, as you finish each book I'll translate it into Swahili. Your school children march and salute the flag in morning exercises in Northeast Congo. Soon they will be in classes. The Bible is taught every day, and many of these children are converted. So in 1964, the first book uh, rolled off the press, Start of the Race. I've, I've edited some, some of Dr. Harlow's works, um, and of course, he is brilliant obviously, but he can take profound truth and make it simple. And I think that that, as a teacher, I think that that it requires the, high, the highest skill level. I think basically any teacher can teach the bright kids because they're basically going to teach themselves anyways and you just have to steer them. But to be able to take something that is so profound and beautiful and make it that um, somebody without that level of English can grasp it, to me that's just the height of skill. They were in, New, in the New York area until um, about 1966 and then they moved the, to the Toronto area but before long their bedrooms and all the spare space was filled up with uh, Gestetners for duplicating and with autotypists and the various things needed so they eventually moved in to a small office and then eventually in 1972 they moved on to, uh, into a chapel on Glebe Mount, and in 81, they moved into the location in Scarborough where they remained until 2002. Well, in the earlier years, the books were printed uh, commercially, and at one point, they were even sent to Hong Kong. Uh, there were some disadvantages to that because they had to produce in large quantities, two to 3,000 per title, in order to get a good per book rate. But that presented problems, of course, because it tied up a lot of funds in one particular title. And it also created sh uh, problems in the, in the warehouse because the one title required a lot of shelf space. And then it created a third problem because it, it made a big, long waiting list of books that were waiting to be printed until funds were sufficient to be able to uh, produce in those quantities. And so when I came on, it was, they had already uh, had a little offset press. Harold had used it, used it I think, when he was going to, to trade school. And they used that to print small projects. And uh, we did a, a little bit of it in-house. But it indicated that probably there was some potential there to, uh, to get some of our own equipment. And with the help of volunteers, 
uh, to be able to produce our own books in smaller quantities and in a more practical way. So, Amazing the way that the Lord works when He intends to make change. And He soon had us moving to Port Colborne. Within a very short period of time, the Lord had um, he brought in new volunteers, he brought in new equipment, he he'd changed the uh, facility, he'd upgraded the facility. So now our fulfillment rate is 100%. Our inventory is low, the people are getting books free, and who knows how many people have grown in the Lord in all those years, it's marvelous to watch him. The Apostle Paul said that he would want to forget what things are behind, reach forth that which is before, press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Beloved, I would do anything to win two words, two monosyllabic words from the Lord Jesus Christ sitting on his throne. Well done, wouldn't you? Then last November, when the doctor got ready to leave for Florida, he said, you know, I won't be back to Park Over anymore. So I said, Doc, where are you going? Where are you going? Well, I said, I'm going home. I'm going home. But he said, take care of things while I'm gone. And I'll see you in the morning. Look forward to it. The end of life is called in Scripture, loosing the moorings. To set sail and to be instantly with Christ is far better than life in this world. However, it is also the end of all opportunity for service. Take this opportunity, a fresh dedication to Him who gave us all for you. But if there's going to be a legacy, it can't be just with fond thoughts of Ed Harlow. He was a great man, but but his desire was to stimulate other people and to encourage them to, to go on in the things of God. May the Lord encourage us to, in ourselves, be a kind of heritage to Dr. Harlow by taking up the task that he uh, accomplished so well in his life and to care for the lost. I speak on behalf of untold thousands of people whose names we do not know little villages and teeming cities all over the world who benefited from the ministry of Ed Harlow because he dared to believe God. And the last thing Dr. Harlow would like us to do is to sit around. He'd want us to be up and doing as he was, right to the village. Some of the projects that we're currently working on here at Everyday Publications would be, first of all, the Congo Swahili Believer's Bible Commentary. This is Gertrude Harlow's project. She's now in her late 80s, and she is committed to translating the entire Believer's Bible Commentary New Testament, Bill McDonald's Believer's Bible Commentary New Testament, into Congo Swahili. She's in the book of Ephesians right now. She believes that the Lord is going to keep her here. She's praying, at least, that the Lord will keep her here until she can finish that project. She is literally, with, her, with age and arthritis and other health issues, she's literally typing with two fingers. But she is pressing on uh, because she has such a heart for the people of Congo. She has been an amazing woman in no time to quit. It says that she has translated 39 books of Dr. Harlow's. That's just a beginning for her. Because since then, she's been one of the most recent things she has done is she's been involved in the translation of the Swahili Bible um, with some of her good friends from the Congo. And what, what we see from her now is that, well, about 88,000 of those Bibles have been distributed at no cost to the Congo. Uh, 52,000 hymn books have gone to the Congo. And the first um, version of the 
McDonald commentary has gone 5,000, all at no cost, and I believe they will impact that culture. I think they will change that culture. That's Mrs. Harlow's work. So today, she soldiers on. I believe as long as the Lord leaves her with us, she will be the pace setter for everyday publications. I would have to say one of the greatest blessings about being involved with the Ministry of Everyday Publications is the people that God has brought to be part of this ministry. The, the love that I have for the people here and the love that I feel from them is amazing. The unity, the way that God has brought people to this ministry who are gifted in different ways, different talents, uh, different skill sets, has been amazing and so encouraging. I've referred to everyday publications as the happiest place on earth or heaven on earth. And that's not just a trite saying. Volunteers are a very necessary part of everyday publications. All of our translators, our proofreaders, our verse checkers are volunteers. In the print shop, most of our finishing and binding is done by volunteers. It's amazing to work with people that are so committed to reaching the world with literature. It's a, it's a dramatic thing to see that so many hundreds of thousands of people have lives have been touched by this group. If I, were to, if I was to look into the future and try to, try to express what I think the vision would be of everyday publications or the ministry of everyday publications, I really don't know if I could put that into words because the focus has been from, from the very beginning, Lord, what do you want? What do you want to do with this ministry? What do you want to do with the people involved? So to be honest, I would be very hesitant to even even suggest something because I'm sure it would be far short of what the Lord will, will bring about. I would like to see if, if the Lord tarries and EPI is still here in 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years, whatever it might be, again, that we are right in the center of His will and that He is being glorified to the maximum through what is happening here, that everything that He desired and wanted to accomplish through everyday publications is happening. God wants to make something beautiful of your life, beautiful in His eyes, more beautiful than anything in nature. By loving, faithful service, you will be made more like His Son, thus bring pleasure to the Father's heart. You will also have the joy of bringing many to the Savior, to heaven for all eternity.